Awesome. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, panelists. Uh, welcome, artists who we have in the room here with us. Um, welcome to this Putting in Work panel series, series 2.0. Um, we're really excited to be here with all of you today. Uh, my name is Rebecca Harrison. Uh, I'm the executive director uh, at Unity Charity. Uh, we also have over here, we have Andel. Andel is our artist manager. He's going to be co-moderating today, asking questions and weighing in. Uh, and then we also have Nick. So Nick is our moderator. Uh, you're going to see him. If you guys have any tech questions at all, um, you can uh, weigh in in the chat and Nick will do his best to help you out. Uh, he's also going to be shooting links and Instagram handles and stuff like that into the chat there. Um, so uh, so if you, have, if you have any questions, uh, Nick is there for you. Um, uh, yeah, so we're uh, just a quick couple of housekeeping items and intros here. Uh, of course, we are Unity Charity. Uh, for anybody who's here with us for the first time, uh, we're a national organization that uses hip hop art forms to help young people develop resilience. We work across the country, mostly in Ontario, Halifax, and Winnipeg. Um, and yeah, I'm actually, what I'm going to do here, so that's the organization, um, we'll do housekeeping, we'll intro our panelists, and then we'll get into to the meet, the questions and stuff. Um, what I'm going to do here is throw up a quick poll. Um, so as I'm continuing through these intros and stuff like that, I'm going to ask everybody to go ahead and fill in this poll question. Continue. So can folks see the poll? Yeah, yeah, okay, sick. So go ahead and fill that in. I'm going to keep talking. <clears throat> um, so housekeeping, folks with diverse abilities, I want you to know that there's going to be a recording of this session after the fact uh, that has uh, subtitles uh, for you to take a look at, closed captioning. Um, we also want folks to know, like I said, we have our moderation assistant here. If you have any tech issues at all, um, please uh, just ask Nick. What's the question here? Is there all of you? Oh, as an option? No, you're just gonna have to pick one, I think. I don't think we put in all of the above, but noted to your question there. Um, uh, I'm gonna ask folks, if you have questions relating to the content, make sure that you put it into the Q&A function at the bottom there, instead of throwing it in the chat so that we don't lose your questions. Um, and just a heads up, there is gonna be a, a quick uh, survey at the end when you exit, uh, when you exit, uh, the panel is going to take you to a survey. We're always appreciative of people's feedback. Uh, it helps us know how we can learn and grow and helps us decide uh, panel topics for the future. So if you have 30 seconds to fill that in uh, after the webinar, we super appreciate it. Um, and of course, I want to do uh, a thank you to our sponsors. So a huge thank you to TD for supporting this panel series, which is a part of Unity's um, artist development and training program uh, through the TD Ready Commitment. Uh, so TD's goal is to help people feel a sense of belonging in their communities, uh, and to do that, TD supports arts and culture events, initiatives, and organizations across North America that amplify diverse voices. Uh, so big thank you to TD, to the Ready Commitment for being awesome allies to our organization and helping us to create opportunities like this where we can share knowledge uh, with our community. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to dive into, and Del and I are going to do a couple of uh, acknowledgments here. Uh, so first, I'd like to acknowledge and ex express gratitude to be connecting with all of you today from land that is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people, and is now home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Um, we also acknowledge that Toronto was covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit, um, I'd also like to take a quick moment to share some of the work that Unity is doing to evolve as an organization uh, that's a better ally to Indigenous youth and communities. Um, so first, uh, we're actually going to be working with an elder for the first time as an organization to present our acknowledgments at our upcoming festival events in the next couple of weeks. Um, this has already opened new doors for partnership and growth within our team, which we're really excited about. Um, we've also increased the organizational budget that we allocate to culturally relevant trainings in an effort to build capacity uh, among our team internally and for our frontline work with young people as well. Uh, and final, finally, we've put together a, a solidarity committee that's going to be leading our team's strategic planning and growth as we work toward building alongside Indigenous youth and communities in the future. Uh, and just on behalf of the organization, we're really excited to be learning and growing and finding meaningful ways to enact our belief that every child matters. 
I'm gonna pass it to Andel here for a second acknowledgement. Yeah, can everyone hear me okay? Pretty good. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you, for, uh, Rebecca, for that. Also, uh, as an organization that achieves impacts through hip hop art forms, uh, we, Unity acknowledges the legacy of Black community and its contribution to the hip hop in general and the culture. Uh, and also, along with that, there is also uh, members of different cultures that contributed to the origins of this dance. Uh, uh, I hope I'm, I'm uh, labeling it or saying it properly, but the you know the uh, the Latino community, uh, the indigenous community, that all came together in uh, unfortunate condition uh, situations to come together and build something as beautiful as hip hop that is enjoyed around the world by well, pretty much billions of people, and it's a billion dollar industry as well. Um, and as an organization, we encourage that we all continue to promote the value and importance of of hip hop as a space for community arts and culture, uh, and, and building and growth. Um, and we, we, we encourage that we all continue to pay homage to the OGs and the current practitioners that are leading the way. Um, and we can learn from their experiences as we continue our own individual journeys through this culture of hip hop. Awesome. Thank you, Mandel. Okay, now exciting. I'm very excited to introduce our panelists here. Um, I know this is always like slightly an embarrassing thing as I talk through your bios while you're here. So. <laughs> Here we go. I'm going to introduce Ray first. Ray Msiri is a Toronto-based artist known for his abstract calligraphy. Unlike traditional calligraphy, which is focused on words, in his expressionistic pieces, Ray captures the sublime motions of movement, rhythm, and emotion through his fusion of graffiti, ancient calligraphic elements, and both modern and classical architecture. Ray's work has been featured with exhibitions and organize, organizations including Art Basel Miami, McLaren, and Google. As an artist, his vision for his creations is to unite people from different walks of life through weaving cultural aesthetics they resonate with. Ray, welcome. So happy to have you back uh, and ch chiming in from a quiet location. Appreciate you. <laughs> Um, Andrew Chung, also known as Pyro. Andrew Chung, but, oh, there it is. <laughs> Better known as Pyro, has a reputation on the street dance competition floor as a jack of all trades within the street dance culture. Having won over 20 different freestyle competitions, popping, locking, open style, break dancing, and hip hop throughout North America in multiple styles since 2006, Pyro has been a great influence by setting standards within his hometown community of Toronto, Ontario. Welcome, Pyro. We're so glad to have you here. Uh, next, we have Miranda Forbes. Miranda is the manager, producing, and administration at the Dance Umbrella of Ontario. Before working with DUO, she was the choir manager and executive director of the Mississauga Children's Choir. She served on the MCC Board of Directors from 20, 2017 to 2019. She holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Performance Dance from Ryerson and studied Arts Administration at Humber College. She has performed dance, taught early years ballet, and produced dance on camera. Her choreographic work on film has been shown in New York and Helsinki. Miranda, welcome. We're so happy to have you here for the first time as a panelist with Unity. Welcome. Uh, and finally, last but not least, we have Dante Berardi. Dante cut his teeth for over a decade and a half as an active touring musician with acts like Cairo, The Balconies, Samsung and Samson and Chloe Charles and has touring experience that spans Europe, the UK, Canada and the US. Dan Dante now works for KTEL International and has held positions in AR, management and project consulting with companies like Anthem Records and, Big and Good People Artist Management. Dante is also an artist mentor through Canada's Music Incubator Program, a Factor Juror, a CCMA and Juno Delegate, and an advocate for Toronto Music City. Wow, 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 Dante, amazing to have you here. Also first time as a panelist with Unity, so super stoked to have you all here. Um, okay, that's it. That's the housekeeping. That's the instructions. That's the panelists. We're ready to get, get into the juice of it here. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, so uh, as everybody knows, putting in work, um, the theme that we picked this year is the artist portfolio. Um, and the whole purpose of the putting in work series, for those of you who don't know, um, we have an artist training and development program that Andel runs year round. We work with a roster of about 75 hip hop artists from across Canada. And the majority of the trainings that we offer are specifically for the roster. But the Putting in Work series is the one offering every year that we like to open up to folks uh, outside of the organization uh, and really try and pick topics that are relevant uh, to emerging artists across art forms. 
um, as an organization that works with a lot of artists, puts on a lot of performances, um, we were thinking to ourselves, okay, what's something that we see a lot of? What do we see artists struggling a lot with? And one of those things was the artist portfolio. So we decided to dedicate the whole panel series, um, not to general vague topics. We really wanna get into the practical instructions of what is a portfolio, how do you build a portfolio, and how do you use a portfolio once you've built it? So this first session that we're gonna be doing here today, we're gonna to be talking about breaking it down. What makes a great artist portfolio? If you wanna find out how to build the components, you gotta come next week. And if you wanna find out how to use it, once you built it, you have to come the third week as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, the added bonus here for those of you who didn't catch it or who want to sort of send notes to other people as well, um, for those of you who participate in the panels, the first 50 individuals um, will get a free headshot as well. We're going to be setting up photographers in Toronto, Winnipeg, and Halifax. So if you're in any of those cities, tell your friends, make sure they come through to the next through. And once we get to that 50, um, yeah, we'll be setting up bios, which is, I'm sure people will tell you, an important piece of an artist portfolio. <laughs> so, um, okay, so our first question here, 101, I'm gonna put this to each of the panelists. From your perspective, what is an artist portfolio and what can it be used for in your art form or industry? So one more time, what is an artist portfolio and what can it be used for in your art form or industry? And I'm actually just gonna copy it here and throw it in the chat so people can see the question as well. Um, let me put it to Ray first. Ray, what's an artist portfolio and what can it be used for in your art form or industry? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> first one on virtual bingo. All right, everybody hear me now? Okay, awesome. Um, okay, so I, I'd say an artist portfolio is like a, a quick summary of uh, what you want to share with people on what you're valuable at uh, and why is it, uh, what it's used for and why is it important. It's important because it is what you need uh, to earn somebody's trust that you could do a good job. So uh, to me, like a lot of people use words like sales and, you know, convincing and all these things. I think it's this very as simple as transferring your trust to somebody else and making sure that they can see that you're you're consistent and skilled and experienced at what you do. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ray. Um, can I put it now to Pyro? Pyro, from your perspective in your art form industry, what is an artist portfolio and what can it be used for as a dancer? Uh, yeah, so as a, as a dancer, choreographer, uh, working through film and television and live show, like productions and stuff, um, you need, like it's a necessity that you have a proper portfolio. Uh, it's your first impression. And just in life in general, first impressions are, are really, really huge, you know? So uh, obviously like the headshot, a cover letter, depending on what it is it's for, uh, your resume, which is properly structured, um, a headshot, full body shot, all that stuff uh, within your portfolio. And it's it's just like this package. A lot of it is done online now. So like, um, it, it's like a, a file that you could just like click on and stuff and have, see your dance reel and, and all that stuff in, in all in one place. But, uh, but it's that first impression that somebody needs to see. And then once they see it, uh, for example, if you're uh, going submitting to try to get representation at a, for an agent or if you're submitting to a casting director, uh, when it comes to like movies and TV shows, when there's dancers involved, there's like so many dancers that are involved and everybody is trying to get casted to, to be involved with this. So, so to have a very, very organized portfolio so people could just look at it uh, quickly and see that you have experience and they can uh, count on you um, is super, super important. So that's what awesome. the portfolio in general is for. Awesome. Love that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to flip it over to Dante. Um, Dante, I'm going to, I'm going to make you repeat some of what you said, Pyro, because the next question is about the specific components of a portfolio in your art form. So I'm going to come back to that. Um, but Dante, what's an artist portfolio and what can it be used for in your art form or industry? Uh, yeah, in my experience, it's basically showing people 
very concisely what it is that you do and what your skill is. Uh, and then backing that up with, these are the things that I've achieved with that skill and this is what I have to offer. Um, you know, I, it's for me interchangeable with like in, in the music world, going and seeing an artist live, you get a sense of what they're offering, you get a sense of who they are, you get a sense of their performance style. Um, when it comes to a portfolio, that's something that now, uh, like Pyro said, it, it, it's more digital than anything, but it's, it's kind of, it's the first step to, to that, you know, uh, if I was interested in something or I wanted to see something, usually the first step is asking to see those things. Uh, and it just gives me a brief snapshot of what you do and who you are and what you've achieved and what you want to achieve. Um, and there's different ways, shapes and forms that you can put that together. And I've seen a variety of different ways that have all been interesting in the past, but I think it's really just a snapshot of, of what it is that you do and, and why that, that, why that's important, you know? Awesome. That's great. Thank you, Dante. And last but not least, I'm going to flip it down to Miranda. Miranda, I know you're also in the dance play, dance space, but mm -hmm. um, between you and Pyro, we've got really different representation in terms of art forms and disciplines within dance. So mm -hmm. uh, again, yeah, what's an artist portfolio in the space you work in and uh, how can it be used in your industry? Yeah, so I, I work mostly in the nonprofit sector, so away, kind of away from the commercial sector, but there is, you know, crossover. Um, I will say that an artist portfolio in the nonprofit sector can be useful when you attend performing arts conferences. Um, and, and like everyone has said, it's, it's just a snapshot of what you do, um, the value of your work, your artist statement. Being able to write about dance is not the, the most easy uh, task. Um, so it's, re it's really a, a good practice to be able to speak about your work and talk about the form that you do, what it's influenced by, um, who trained, who you trained with, who, um, who you performed for, those sorts of things. Um, and so, yeah, I will say an artist portfolio is most useful at um, conferences where people are looking to buy work, presenters, nonprofit presenters uh, internationally are looking to, um, to book dance artists. And so that's what it's useful for. Also uh, securing government funding. So I'll talk a little bit about grants. Um, and so the portfolio, having a strong artist statement just sets you up nicely to be able to secure government funding um, for your work. So. Awesome. Um, so many, yeah, so many interesting answers there. And I, I'm loving the makeup of the panelists that we have here because there's so many different angles, like information that we just got from your first answers. Um, I especially love the pieces that you mentioned about um, the idea of first impressions and trust. Uh, I think that's something that you see uh, a lot of artists make mistakes and then they learn over time where it's like, okay, how do, I, how do I come across professionally and concisely? Um, and so great to hear for, for the artists who are in the room today to thinking about the portfolio as being, you know, if we've learned in lieu of doing everything virtually when you can't catch a performance, you can't meet someone in person, or maybe your casting is not in person, um, to have a strong portfolio that will represent you and your work well and your achievements well is really, really awesome. Um, another thing that I heard that I think was really interesting here is, a lot of it, because my next question actually relating to this one is at what point should an artist have a portfolio? But so many of the things that you all said relate to if you want to make money, if you want to book opportunities, any kind of professional opportunity, you need to have a portfolio in place. So any of the artists who are here today, I guess, well, I'll, I'll put this to anybody who wants to answer it, any of the four of you. Like I said, the question is... Um, Hang on, where is it here? At what point in their career should an artist start to compile a portfolio? Right away. <laughs> Yesterday, yeah, Pyro. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it doesn't matter what uh, skill set you have. So, because I know I actually experienced a lot of people, oh, I'm not ready yet. Uh, I'm going to wait till I'm ready, this and that, whatever. But uh, when it comes down to, um, for like the industry of like film and television or anything like that, there's, there's roles for everything. Um, so, cause like if you're looking for someone, you're only going to hire like the best of the best all the time, then that means like you're never going to see these dance shows with little kids in them because little kids, they're not always the most uh, experienced dancers, you know, but, uh, but sometimes it's about like your look and, and, 
and what what else you have to offer maybe you can act on the side like there's a lot of different things so right when you get started and and, and as an as an artist if you feel like you want to do something uh with this i feel like you should be especially with like having quality cameras on your phones um and all this stuff like catching like footage of yourself um through your process you know not not only for portfolios but also just for yourself to see your growth in, uh as it goes along you know for sure <clears throat> did anybody else want to weigh in on that of when should you start building a portfolio uh yeah i want to say like uh, same thing uh maybe you don't need to finalize it like every day like every month you don't need to do that if you're not ready to like jump into opportunities um but uh, I'd say for at the very least, start organizing your, your data, whatever it is, photos, videos. Because for example, me, I made a huge mistake of uh, when I first was ready to get opportunities. I waited three years before I compiled anything. So then it took me like three weeks to get, like I'm trying to remember where I went, what I did, uh, you know, all the shows or um, all these things. And, and, and it took forever. So it's just nice to just kind of keep a folder on the side. And, and just kind of take note of what you've done. So whenever you're ready to look for opportunity, it's easy for you to package it and, and make move on to making a portfolio. Awesome. Thanks, Ray. Um, okay, I'm gonna jump into the next uh, set of questions here. Um, and then getting into, okay, so getting into the specifics here. So from your perspective in your field, what are important components to include in a portfolio? So I'm going to start with Miranda this time. Miranda, from your perspective, what are the components that, uh, like you were saying, in the nonprofit dance space? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I will say, you know, in dance, uh, we're fortunate to have really great images come out of the work. So great photography of you dancing is essential. Um, great video that's not too dark, that's, you know, well lit, well, well produced. Um, is is essential and then yeah I'll, I'll just be a broken record on this but a little bit of text about the movement work that you do will, will go a long way and it's good to start practicing that early starting to write about such a visceral form so yeah, yeah. the artist mm -hmm. bio I'm excited the to bio. dive to the details of the artist bio yeah the well, bio it's, sometimes it's a hard thing to do yeah, yeah. yeah. For sure. I was just thinking I need to update my bio when I heard my bio, but yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's an ongoing process too. So start early. That's yeah. hilarious. Thanks, yeah. Miranda. Uh, Dante, can I flip it to you? Um, the question yeah. being, uh, what are important components to include in a portfolio in your industry? Yeah, I mean, in my experience, um, obviously, you know, a promo photo, um, a private SoundCloud link is always uh, a nice thing as well with, you know, not every song you've ever written, but the thing that you feel strongest about that represents you and what you do. Um, I'll be honest, like it really anything, I, I just, anytime I get anything like that, I'm looking to get a sense of who I'm talking to on whatever level that is, whether it's for an opportunity or whether it's just a mentoring situation. Um, so, I mean, I've seen it go as deep as, you know, fonts that you can use. This is my front facing font. This is my website font. Right. Um, you know, this is my logo here are downloadable links to my logos. You know, you can go as deep as you want. Uh, but I think Ray touched on a really good point that just starting and having a fluid folder or a fluid, whatever it is that you're just constantly building these things up over time. It's not going to be like you ever go, okay, my portfolio is done. I'm, I'm done because that's not how a career goes in any art form. Uh, you're constantly growing, you're constantly changing, you're constantly getting new wins. So you're going to constantly be changing this thing. It's going to grow as you grow. And it also becomes a really good uh, tool for you to look at the wins that you're putting up on the board and say, hey, I'm actually doing some good things here. This, I should be proud about the things that I'm doing, which again, informs, goes back into your art, informs what you're doing. So yeah, it can go as deep as you want, but really for me, it's just starting, you know, just, mm -hmm. just start with, start with the photo, start with the, the tangible thing and then go from there. Okay. So that's really great. Uh, Pyro, can I flip it to you? What are important components to include in a portfolio for the kind of work that you do? Um, when going, uh, auditioning for anything, you need to have a package with you, especially if, um, especially if the, uh, audition is in person, which hopefully that'll start up again. Um, but even if it's online, uh, uh, dance reel has been more important than ever these days. Uh, so that's super important, but 
um, now that things are becoming more in person. Wait, did you say a dance reel? Is a dance you- reel. Real. Yeah. A dance reel of, of just moves that you are, you can, uh, just like a, an example of the things that you can do and things that you can offer and the experience that you have all mashed up into like a one minute exciting trailer of yourself. Sick. Yeah, and that's what a dance reel would be. Um, but uh, you need um, your headshot. This is like in for people watching that want to make like a portfolio that you could hand to an agent or something like that. I was going to say from page one should be your headshot. So it's a visual so they see who you are. And then the behind that should be your resume separated within film category, television category, commercial category, live shows and performances category, special skills category, all, all separated like that with all your information, name, height, never your age. Don't add your age in there because they're not allowed to ask that. And maybe you look young, but you're old. So you could still play like a high school character, whatever. So never put your age. Um, and then from there, if they ask for a, bo- a full body shot, you add that in there, cover your letter after that. And then something with like your reel on there. So you could either email it to them or have a link that's even written um, on your resume somewhere. Uh, Just because like the first thing you want them to see is like you. If the first thing on the front is your resume and it's just a bunch of words, it's not gonna attract them as much. So you should definitely put a visual on on your front cover, which is a really dope headshot, professional headshot that of yourself. Mm. Oh, and one last thing. What's actually really important these days right now, uh, and it should have been important all the time, is adding your pronouns in there. Because as they're hiring uh, these days, they're trying to be like, uh, do things properly within gender and race. Uh, So they're very uh, aware, more aware of that uh, within the film and television industry. So I've seen, actually seen people uh, book gigs because of their pronouns uh, and that happened only recently. So so definitely um, add that in there. <clears throat> That's dope, thanks Pyro, super, uh, super specific there, love that. Love that practical stuff, you know? <laughs> um, Ray, I'm gonna flip it to you, visual arts, murals. What are the components that need to be included in a portfolio? Uh, I, I think that everybody touched upon like mainly the m- most important parts, so headshot, bio, resume, um, making sure you have a nice, even a nice theme to your portfolio, you know, like brand theme, have your logo, but choose some colors that represent you and keep them consistent throughout the whole thing. Uh, Personally, uh, because everything uh, major has been mentioned, uh, one thing that really works for me is making sure that it caters. So I really need to know who I'm handing it to. So what I do, uh, my life hack is I have all my artwork uploaded on Canva. It's like a, it's a website, canva.com. And basically I can put my portfolio anytime, anywhere through my cell phone. Like I pick all the artwork that I want on it. It's already ready with titles, videos, links, everything. And literally I slide it in, I pick it all and then I can send it as a PDF or as a uh, slideshow or as an email. Uh, But I always need to know who I'm sending it to because for example, like um, uh, let's say uh, it's for a restaurant, right? So I'm going to send like more interior design oriented mural work. I'm not going to send them a car that I painted. It, they, they, that's not what they're looking for, right? So I need to get straight to the point uh, and so that when they scroll through it, they, they absorb as uh, much information as fast and as easy as possible. So okay. I, I would say that just the convenience, making it as convenient as possible for people to know about you. That's yeah. cool. So we're going to touch more in the second uh, panel as well for folks who are here. We're going to get into some of like the best tools to use, to capture and to host stuff. So make sure you come next week. We'll get into more into what Ray was talking about. Um, But I wanted to actually uh, take the point that you made there, Ray, about um, tailoring your resume. So it's interesting because Pyro, you were talking about um, having like the same structure every time, like at an audition or casting call or whatever. Would you say similarly um, that you would still tailor the content depending on the opportunity? Yeah, definitely. So uh, to be more specific and, and, and Ray is like totally, totally on, on point with that. Um, When it comes down to your headshot, you have 
there's different types of headshots that you should have. You should always have a back, like a backup black and white one that like looks mm -hmm. neutral. Cause a lot of people, not me, but uh, a lot of people dye their hair, cut their hair, um, for example. So if you have a black and white one, it doesn't really matter. It's like an emergency one. Like, oh, I just dyed my hair, but they want my hair black or blonde. So here's a black and white one. This is what I look like and I'll dye it when I need to. Um, but your headshot kind of has to be like done like at least like every year like because uh, they hate it when you show up and you don't look like your headshot you should have one that makes you look young for young dance roles you should have I have an acting one where I just like am, am in like a dress wait I think I have it right here <laughs> right there there you go <laughs> right? so I have that acting one I have a dance one like that's how you like cater towards the specific job that you are going towards for sure Awesome. Uh, and then Ray, uh, Dante as well, um, obviously all kinds of different opportunities that can be booked um, within the music industry. You suggest tailoring the portfolio depending on the kind of opportunity or like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it, if you were trying to book a gig or trying to get into, a, you know, a publication to get a press hit or something, you would obviously want to use different things. Um, you know, if you're trying to get a show, you'd want to include videos, you'd want to, you know, uh, talk about your tour history, you'd probably want to talk about shows that you've done really well at, have you sold out any shows, what were the numbers at that shows, what was your merch sale per head at that show, uh, if you're going for press publication, then you'd probably want to talk more about editorial things like what other press publications have covered you, who's your, who's your publicist, you know, that kind of stuff, because they're, they're different things, right, so again, it goes back to that idea of, this is not a, a one and done thing. This is a fluid, uh, you know, I guess resume is the easiest thing to call it, but it's a fluid thing that's going to evolve with you over time. And then you're going to have to kind of have different versions of it that are always there. But then as opportunities are going to come up, you're going to kind of have to flip a switch and go, ah, you know, it'd probably be better if I put that blog TO article I was in in this one and send that because that'll look more impressive for this, you know. So mm -hmm. it really is... Um, it really is a, a fluid thing that you kind of always have to be on top of. And part of that, again, going back to, I can't remember who mentioned it earlier, but it's just keeping track of all these things as they're coming in because you don't want to have to go, oh, what was that thing I did four years ago in Germany? You know, you don't want to have to track that stuff down later, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely, I would definitely cater it depending on what I was going after. It just it makes sense. The same way you would do with a resume if you're applying for a job, you know? Yeah. Your, your your cover letter for a resume is going to be different for different companies. So why wouldn't your resume as an artist be the same, you know? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and then finally, I'm going to take this idea of sort of customization to Miranda. Um, from the grants perspective, um, you know, I feel like it's, it's sometimes a struggle, the balance of thinking about representing yourself in a grant as like who I am as an artist but then also similarly wanting to like fit into whatever, you know, whether it's um, arts council or more industry funding, like, you know, factor or something like that. That's music, obviously. But can you yeah. speak a little bit to how you balance the individuality and brand of an artist with fitting into whoever's got the bag? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, grants, you know, it is a business plan that you're presenting. So, Yes, and, and I think artists can, can do this really well, um, you know, wear many hats and, and, and speak um, in a way that um, proves that they can execute on their artistic practice because, you know, it's what you do and you know how to do it. Um, but there are some practical elements like a balanced budget, making sure what you write about um, your, that you're going to do is actually... Um, shown in the budget, um, and so there are no discrepancies. But um, I will say you can't, the councils want to hear from artists, they want to hear the artist's voice, they still want to know who is coming to the table, and, and the, the grants are assessed by a, a jury of your peers, a jury of artists, so but it will be read by artists, um, and so you don't have to make it um, completely business administrative speak, you can still speak to um, what you're trying to achieve, your values, and those sorts of things. But yeah, that's kind of the, the gist of the, the granting world. But it is, it is much different than the commercial world. Um, for sure. 
for sure, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Two quick thing. So one funny, uh, I think a couple of people have mentioned this, the idea of starting to just log your work, like a Word doc, a Google doc, notes in your phone, something where you mm -hmm. start, you've heard a couple of different people suggest the categories by which you would organize your work. Like for Pio, you were saying, film, television, performances. Uh, for Ray, it might be, you know, interior, exterior, uh, commercial, like, I don't know, you know, and starting. So I feel like a great exercise, you know, to think about, okay, who am I as an artist? In what realms do I work? And how can I just, just download it? You know, I remember sitting with an artist one time recently last year trying to help them build up an artist CV. Um, and they found that, yeah, picking those categories and starting to just list stuff is really validating as an artist because every single thing you do, most artists, you hustle all the time. And like, you know, every time you have a gig or a performance or a panel or a this or a that or a feature, like it all counts. It all counts. So it can be, you know, a really great exercise to start capturing that stuff. And then to your point, Miranda, uh, Unity Charity, we wrote a grant recently for an arts council and they told us that it was too professional. <laughs> Flip the table. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> We had to get artsier with it. So I don't know. I think that's like, if you get to the point where they're telling you you're too professional, <laughs> you're doing okay. Anyway. Um, awesome. Okay, so I'm going to flip to the uh, next, the third question here. Um, what makes a portfolio really stand out to you? Um, so uh, it's a two, yeah, okay, we'll go with this one first. What makes a portfolio really stand out? And conversely, maybe we'll also go with what really is a bad look when it comes to the contents of a portfolio. What's a big no-no? Uh, so let's flip it to Pyro. Pyro, can you go first? Yes. Uh, so, yeah, just having uh, worked on some films, uh, film and television and commercials uh, as a choreographer, um, a lot of resumes and headshots would be sent to me. Um, the first thing that and and even just like sitting by other casting directors and seeing uh, them flip through these things while auditioning to cast dancers and stuff. Um, it's a really quick process. So a lot of people feel like they need to overcompensate to show that they are worth what they are, like adding a lot of stuff and, and whatever, but it needs to be like really to the point because there's, when people audition for things, like everybody knows that like the whole entire community is like trying to make some money and there's, there, there's one, there's that one job or two jobs or whatever. So everyone's going for all these opportunities and everyone is most likely prepared uh, to do it, but there's a lot of overcompensation going on. So you need to get straight to the point and you need to be organized. The more organized you are, like, again, that first impression is going to show that um, you know what you're doing. Um, and when you're setting your reel, uh, your dance reel, just make sure, again, a lot of people try to go from like, oh, I did this. And then they put another section of another video there and then they go back to another section. Um, there's a lot of casting directors that like see people going back and forth to different videos and they take that as um, that you don't have enough material. So you keep going back to the, back and forth to the same ones. Mm. And also I know a lot of casting directors do not like to see, even if it's done professionally, uh, footage that's shot inside a dance studio. It, kind of comes off because any everyone is allowed to dance in a dance studio yeah. but not everyone is allowed to dance on a music video or a television show or something like that so at the best if you haven't done like a, a movie or a tv show or commercial the best thing to do is find a really dope location film it properly maybe have some like friends around just to, uh and and just use that because that's probably better than doing a really dope piece in front of the mirror or something like that. So those are the things that like you sh definitely should not do, but definitely keep that organized. And, and this is kind of, it is relevant, but just show up and be, be like a reliable source because the, from the cameramen to the casting directors, to the directors, to everybody, they all know each other. Everybody knows each other. So when, there's so many jobs that I like show up to and they're like, 
oh, hey, remember me from this movie or, or something like that? I'm like, oh, wow, like whatever. And, and I got hired from cameramen referring me, be like, going like, oh, yeah, actually, I do know someone that might, we might be able to find. Mm -hmm. And I'm just getting hired being like, I don't know, I have no idea why I'm here. And then I find out later on that someone referred me. So it's super important to just on top of all this portfolio stuff, just to be that reliable source. You know, back up a good portfolio with professional behavior. It's all for nothing, right? Mm. That makes sense. Um, okay, I'm going to flip it over to Dante. Um, uh, what makes a portfolio really stand out to you? Uh, and what is a big red flag when you see somebody submitting a portfolio? I think just trying to keep things clear and concise, um, not getting too wordy, not, trying, not using bud, buzzwords that you can't really back up. Um, you can usually tell that stuff really quickly. Um, the same way, if, you know, you were reading an article, you can tell when things are kind of biased in one way or another, you can tell. Um, some big red flags for me would definitely be when I see stuff and, you know, there's photos and they're pixelated or, um, you know, the, the font choice is maybe one that is really hard to read or, you know, just you want to make it as easy to digest as possible. You don't want to put hurdles up in front of yourself before you're even being considered right you you want to make it an easy yes for people because people are always going to look for a reason to say no uh so don't give them that opportunity you know make it as simple as possible get to the point you know trim the fat as it were like i say that a lot with with grants and stuff you don't have to use five paragraphs to say something that you can say in one paragraph just say the one paragraph be concise about it you know um and it that's always a really tough thing you know i I, from my like past life when I was touring more, I, I would always want to over explain and give more information. It's like, no, say the two sentences that are going to get to the point and, and that, that then your way you're already at the game. If you do that. And, and from the, again, like sort of recording industry, music industry perspective, when it comes to like sharing music, are there any red flags, like whether it's the platform or how you're sharing them or the quality of the music or. It depends on what, what it what it's for you know there's different there's different incarnations of that if it's if it's an artist that maybe i'm working with um you know when i was working at a label if they were sharing writing sessions that they just did a phone demo would be fine but you know if it was an artist delivering an album and it doesn't really sound that good and you can tell it hasn't been mixed or mastered or any of that stuff then it might be a red flag in terms of platforms i mean you know private soundcloud links are always kind of the standard um, I, I, across a lot of times, different jobs I've had, a private SoundCloud links always work. Um, and is the idea with the private SoundCloud link that you're not sending them to your whole public SoundCloud where you have all yeah. of the things that you've ever done since you were 14 on there? Yeah, yeah. So okay. basically, like with a private SoundCloud link, you're going in and you have to go specifically to that track and then share from that track. And then it's um, it's a single link that you send out. You can you can update it as, as you want. Like you can take it down or, or change the link or whatever you want but that's the one that I've seen um the mo most often but again it really goes back to what's the opportunity you know if an artist you know I've had artists slide in my dms on on facebook with a voice memo and like hey what do you think of this and it's like that's that's not like the professional way to go about this you know what I mean it's it's sunday at 4 30 you just let me maybe do it like during the week the work week you know that kind of stuff you just have to consider the fact that the person you're trying to impress is a person and they have their struggles and their life battles and they're just trying to do their job so like try to make it as easy for them to like you as possible you know awesome Thank you. Thanks, Dante. Um, okay, Miranda, um, what makes a portfolio really stand out to you? And I know that you said that you've been, you've sat on, what, is this yours? Have you sat on juries before, like granting juries and stuff? Uh, no, I haven't, but I've helped a lot of artists okay. um, uh, write and submit successful grants. So, yeah. Perfect. So from your perspective, and like you were saying in the nonprofit sector grants, mm -hmm. what really makes a portfolio stand out to you? Um, well, I think any portfolio like if we're bringing a portfolio to a performing arts conference or writing an artist statement in a grant uh check your work for typos i think as soon as you see something that's misspelled or um yeah messy work like that shows that you're not really putting the care into building a uh a, a successful portfolio um i'll second dante pixelated images just drive me crazy um 
yeah, get get a friend who's good in graphic design to help you make sure your um, your images aren't pixelated. Um, and then, yeah, clarity. Uh, I've I've read artist statements where they don't even mention dance, and I'm like, what what are you doing? Like, tell me what you do. You you dance, right? So don't get too high level about what you do. Um, and yeah, be clear. Yeah. Love that. Awesome. Thanks, Miranda. And Ray, last but not least, what makes the portfolio really stand out to you? Uh, I just say like to sum up what everybody's saying as well, just like uh, clarity, quality and consistency. So like for clarity, uh, you also want to do this kind of uh, zoom in uh, strategy that I, I that the way I see it is kind of like zoom in into a Google Maps. Like you, you first zoom in, you, you first zoom into the city, then you zoom into the area, then you zoom into the in intersection, right? So you want to do the same thing where it's like the first sentence, sentence of your bio should kind of really sum up what this whole thing is going to be about, right? And then your next sentence should kind of just get more and more in depth. Uh, don't write too much, but you know, you want to kind of lead people, uh, kind of funnel them further into further information. Um, consistency. Obviously, do not document yourself with a Motorola Razor. Um, it's 2021. Please use high quality <laughs> equipment. The reason why I say that too is because the standards of our eye have increased a lot. When we're, when we're scrolling through Instagram, there are so many photographers now, right? So our, our quality of hearing and seeing media is much higher than, than uh, before. So it, it's less, it's more unacceptable when you have something that's subpar, right? And it also shows that you care. Uh, and consistency, um, I, like just make sure the pieces that you feature, they're of good quality, you know? Don't, don't show one that's like a lot less better than the other. Like try to pick highlights and just hit them with the bangers, you know? And yeah, that's it. Just, uh, and get, make sure that it's to the point because um, also I noticed, uh, at least from my field, uh, uh, when they look, through like our portfolios they skim through them really fast like those like click 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 click, and then they go yes no yes no and then they look again into the yes pile so make sure you you hit them with like with the yes pile material so when they click through it fast it, it's all consistent you know for sure I really like this theme that, again, I've sort of heard emerging across what everybody said which is the idea of really like curating the portfolio and the more time that you can spend curating and tailoring a portfolio for the opportunity the better it's going to land um yeah. and there's always this expression that makes me laugh it's like a spray and pray approach where if you just like like i'll just throw it all in there if something's gonna stick <laughs> what i'm hearing is that that is not a good approach <laughs> it's not a good approach to booking anything it's not a good approach for your portfolio you want to be conscientious and thoughtful about what you put forth for every opportunity, seemingly across all of the industries and art forms that we have represented here. So I think that's really helpful information. Um, okay, so uh, we've talked about what is a portfolio. We've talked about what can you use it for? What are the important components? Uh, we've talked about what makes a portfolio stand out and what makes a portfolio suck. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is pull up this poll because we're gonna take a look and see at what component. <laughs> Ooh, interesting. Hang on. I'm going to end the poll here. Um, end poll. Share results. Okay. So can everybody see that? So this was the idea of what, what portfolio components do people not have? So I'm actually interested to see that there's like fairly, we've got a lot in terms of the promo kit EPK piece here um, is one that a lot of folks don't have. Um, and then it's pretty equal across bio, photos, headshots, uh, and then artist CV. So hang on, one thing. So since we've got kind of even, <laughs> fairly even representation across here. What I'm gonna do is go around and ask each of you, can you just pick one of the components here and give me your hottest tips for helping to build a good one of those things? <laughs> is that cool? Does that make sense? That was not my best worded question. Um, uh, and actually, uh, I, if you don't mind, Dante, just because a number of people said that they don't have an EPK, so there might be lots of recording artists, MCs and stuff in the space. Do you mind talking a little bit about what, 
should be included in a good EPK and what it stands for? That's an electronic press kit. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, to me, the, the word EPK is kind of interchangeable with a lot of different words, like whether it's artist CV or resume. But again, it, it, it's just going back to that. This is, this is me. This is who you'd be hiring if you hired me for and put any you know, opportunity in that spot. Um, in terms of EPK, obviously it's gonna be a little more uh, visual. So, I mean, a lot of times if I was gonna be making something like that, I would immediately find a graphic designer. Um, a lot of this stuff, I'll be honest, from my perspective, I used to try and just figure it out and make it on my own. And then I would look at it and go, this is really bad, <laughs> you know? Um, I, have, I have, personally have a lot of skills, but that is not one of them. So I would go to someone who does have those skills, try to find a friend, try to find someone in my extended network, a friend of a friend, um, you know, maybe try to do an artist trade to try to, you know, bring that price down. I know, you know, money's tight for everybody, uh, but sometimes you got to go to the pros to get this kind of stuff done so that it stands out. Um, in terms of an electronic, you know, an EPK, um, I keep wanting to say the full thing, but I've said it already. So I can just go back to the, the acronym. Uh, I'd say things like, you know, uh, promo photo, a lot of the stuff we've talked about here, you know, promo photo, bio, uh, if, you, if you're getting a, a designer to do it for you, you can do embedded videos, and it would just be something that you send, it lives somewhere on the internet, whatever that is, isn't the important thing, it lives all together, you send the link, they go to it, and they can see everything, whoever they are, whatever the opportunity is, um, so yeah, maybe a couple of your press hits, if you've got some press, um, you know, tour history, discography, you know, what are some of your accolades? What are some of the wins that you've put on the board? That type of stuff. So yeah. it really depends on what uh, the opportunity is. And, um, and you know, it, 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 it's, it's tough. It's different for every artist. So, yeah. But it's also like the idea is that it's like a one pager, right? Like it's like literally one page or maybe max two pages. And then it's all links, right? Like this one place where people can go to all of the things that they want to see you about you Absolutely. one low central location okay cool, cool cool yeah so it'd just be one spot that has everything so if like i mentioned earlier i've uh, in ones that i've created for artists you know we'll have the logo in uh different colors this is the typeface this is our front facing type this is the type that if you're gonna do a, a write-up we'd like you to use uh here's a link to a couple press hits here's a link to a couple videos and it's all if they want to download it they can if they don't want to download it they don't have to but it's just all there um and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure who, who mentioned it, but it, it's, it's all just about looking like you've put thought into these things because you're a business, right? That's, it, we're all trying to, to leverage the skills we have in order to make money um, or, or to, you know, to, to get opportunities. So you want to make people believe and trust that the things you're saying are true and that you can deliver on the things that you're offering. And just having it all be professional and look clean, crisp in one place makes people go, oh, okay, I can put my trust in this pr as a product, you know. For sure, you gotta invest. Thank you, Dante, appreciate it. Um, Miranda, can I flip it to you? Is there one in there where you have some hot tips and tricks to create a really quality? Yeah, well, I guess I'll just continue on the EPK, if that's sure. okay. Sure, yeah, you go know? ahead. Um, just because if you've built a, a dance show and you want to tour it, you want to have it shown in various theaters and anywhere, um, they'll, in the EPK, they'll also want to see a link to your tech writer. So this shows that um, the technical elements that your show needs. Um, I work with some circus artists that need rigging points. Is there, do you need a fog machine? Do you need, is there a certain type of theatrical element that you can't do without? And this will help the presenters understand if it's a good fit. Say if this is a work that is only suitable to play to a hundred seat theaters versus a thousand seat theaters. That's a very good thing to get um, presenters thinking about uh, for your EPK. Yeah. Smart. Thanks, Miranda. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, Ray, is there one in here? I know you talked a bit about bios before. Is there any, you want to jump on that some more or talk about anything else in there? Uh, I guess I just want to give one general tip. Um, I don't make much EPKs. I'm starting to dive into those. Uh, they're very important as well. Uh, but I, I would say, because we talked a lot about documentation, and it could be very intimidating if you don't have a lot of money, because you're like, I can't hire this $1,000 photographer to do it, right? Uh, so I would say, 
uh, one thing that I do is I barter, I used to barter a lot, right? So I'll be like, okay, well, if your service costs a thousand dollars to shoot a video of me, I'll give you a thousand dollar painting. If you're a dancer, you could be like, well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do a thousand dollar performance at your wedding or, you know, birthday party. Like I'll do a flash mob, whatever it is. Right. So just think about these exchanges and then that way you don't have to pay for it, but you still pay for it with, uh, with your talent. Right. Yeah. That's about it. Awesome. Thanks. I appreciate that. Uh, Pyro, is there one on there that you want to jump on and give a little more insight? Um, I'd say, honestly, uh, I'd say just in general, like just put, uh, put time into putting this stuff together, like mm -hmm. have the quality, like, as you can see, like all the panelists, uh, they have all their different experiences. And the thing is, is that when you put your portfolio together and you hand it to somebody that is important to you, like an agent or a casting director or, or one of these people on the panel, um, you could tell you could see from their answers that everyone has something specific like that matters to them whether whether it's fonts whether it's pixelation on uh on photos whether whether it's um where you're dancing in your environment like it's all these little things like just keep in mind that you are sending all this stuff to another human being that has feelings and opinions so you got to really come correct as best as you can and and just have like a nice good first impression uh when you do that um so put your time into doing this stuff uh don't don't think like oh okay cool like uh why didn't why can't i get this all together in like one day like it doesn't happen like that to to find your footage of you dancing like professional footage of you dancing in the past is like is pretty tough like that's like some research you have to do um photos you have to hire a professional to do that. Or if you have a friend, that's even better. Collaboration, uh, that's all great as well. Um, but I will say, just to add on to, on to this that wasn't mentioned, um, that's happening a lot more in my industry, not sure. I'm pretty sure it's happening uh, throughout, is uh, you should have a crispy, clean, like, social media. Because I've seen people get hired through that. Um, and on some, not all, but some like applications, it used to just be like representation, your contact, this and that. And sometimes I see like uh, Instagram um, on there. And if you look at, I saw my Instagram posted earlier. Like if you look at my Instagram, like I took out all of the stuff just because I'm not much of a social media person. Um, like I don't like to like post um daily things or anything like that so i put all the things that need to be there there's, i think there's like maybe like 30 things that are posted on there and it just like kind of stays like that uh so people could go on it and and stuff is there uh in worst case scenario like and that that's the best case is like for example like when someone's like oh we need someone like this and i was like oh what about my friend and uh my friend boneless at this at this time and he and they were like they're like, okay, like, what does he look like? What does he do? Like, whatever. And uh, obviously, I'm like, I don't have his resume. I don't have this. I don't have that. I'm just like, uh, well, here he is. This is his Instagram. And then, you know, there it was. Like, he got hired for a movie. So it's just stuff like that to, like, have something there that's out there. So, you know, put your quality stuff out there. And, you know, if, it's, if social media isn't really your thing, that's cool. Just have like a, some type of like, you know, either a website or something, you know, uh, that can be, cause things are done virtu uh, virtually, like, as you can see us right now, um, mm -hmm. all the time. So you should always be as prepared as you can. So when that opportunity arises, you're ready for it. That's a super awesome suggestion. And I think, um, it's a really nice way to kind of wrap and summarize everything that people have said here in the sense of like, I, I don't know, from my perspective and my, you know, history of working with a lot of emerging artists, there comes a point where there's a struggle in terms of like an artist's individual identity 
and then their professional creative enterprise. And I think what you talked about there is like such a relevant point in terms of like, okay, if I'm getting to a point, I'm building, you know, portfolio to book professional opportunities, talking about your art in a professional way, representing your art in a professional way, making sure that anything you're providing to people who are gonna be providing opportunities to you and thinking about, okay, how do I balance both of these things simultaneously? Um, and even, you know, again, like that's separating out, like, you know, the artist identity exists underneath all of these opportunities. So how do I fly, how do I highlight my work um, and protect, protect my work and professional reputation, like through these tools? Um, yeah, Pyro. Uh, yeah, just to, just to like go off that um, uh, really short, like I just want everyone like that's listening just to just to remember that um, yes you are an artist and you're you're just really focused on what you want to be doing and having fun and just being good at it. But at the end of the day, like you are a brand the same as like Adidas or Nike or anything like that, and those those brands pay millions of dollars just to campaign themselves properly. Like they have a a, a debt like a full conference of like high paid people just to be agree on one picture and be like, yeah, that's okay for the commercial or, or something like that. Uh, just to make sure that everything is like working well. So like as an up and coming artist, um, uh, you're gonna, you have to be the one that cares for yourself. So you have to be, you know, you have to be your own assistant. You are the brand, um, maintain yourself, um, you know, do your emails, like do like you're working every single aspect that other businesses would be would hire other people to do. But you're especially when you first get started, you're doing all of it for yourself. Um, so just be aware of that like you are a brand and the way you come off is like is uh, super important because, you know, no one wants to work with. Uh, uh, sorry, I almost swore. Uh, no one wants to work with someone that's sucky. Yeah. Yeah, waste. <laughs> Nobody wants to work with a waste. <laughs> um, okay, so we have a couple of questions here. Some really good questions. Um, yes, you are your own CEO. I love that. Um, okay, first question here for a dance reel. So I'm going to flip this to you, Pyro. For a dance reel, does it have to come with the title of the jobs for each video? I mean, the thing is, is that not every job that you do is going to have a title, but it does help. Um, if you, for, if you go on my Instagram, my reel is there and you'll see that like, it's going to say the commercial, the commercial brand, like urban planet. And then it's going to show a clip of it. It's going to show the movie name, full out clip, work it clip, the next step clip, like, and that, that actually those titles, those title shots of, of what job or television show uh, you're working on, um, is important because it, it legitimizes your experiences but if you don't have those experiences it's totally fine because if it's a music video if it's uh if it's a live show like they're not going to have these title screens that are made on the on tv or or on your screen for you to record or anything like that so they're not used every single time but when you do get to that point definitely utilize that as a as a tool to legitimize yourself but it's not something that needs to be there it's more important that the first clip that comes out because even a one minute clip comes off too long when the casting director has to watch 200 different one minute clips right so if that first it's more important that that first move that you do is something really exciting so they want to watch the rest of the clip a lot of people try to go like title screen and I look good over here and no, like the first thing that comes out is like title screen and then boom, like, you know, like something that's just like, oh, wow. Okay. Like that's different. So really just start with a bang and, and hope the rest of it is also bangers as well. Yeah. That's dope. Great answer, Pyro. Thank you. I'm going to remind people, we're going to keep going. There's two more questions. I'm going to hit them both, but I just want to get everybody who's in here right now, throw your handles, throw your Instagram handles in the chat. Um, follow up, follow each other up. I know Nick uh, had already put in the Insta handles of our panelists. Nick, if you don't mind tossing them in again, um, just for anybody who came in later. Uh, but yeah, attendees, artists who are here, throw your handles in there. We'll, we can all take a follow, build our following, see what we're all doing and stuff. Um, take advantage. Um, okay, 
Next question in today's, so this one's for you, Dante. In today's music industry, does an EPK still play a significant role in getting opportunities? Same for a website. Do you feel social media and streaming platforms have taken over? Yeah, I mean, it's all part of a package that I would look at for any artist. Like if, if I was managing an artist, let's say, um, you know, I'd want them to have a website just as a hub. Um, but I see a lot of artists that don't do that anymore. Uh, so really, as long as you're representing yourself out there in a way that people can find you on the interwebs and get a sense of what you do, like to Pyro's point, a lot of artists just use their inner, their Instagram handle as their website. And I totally understand that. And some people do it really well. Some people don't do it really well. Um, I don't think there are hard, fast rules when it comes to what you have to have and what you know, you have to have a website, you have to have this, you have to have that. I think you need to figure out for your brand and for your business, because you are a business, um, what works best. And as long as you're representing yourself out there properly, and if I stumble across your handle in this chat and I go to your Instagram, I need to be able to get a sense of who you are and what you're offering. So if your Instagram does that, great. If you feel you need your Instagram and a SoundCloud and your streaming profiles and a website, that's great too. You really have to decide for yourself what works for you and what's getting across that, that brand identity, right? Um, in terms of what, like if I was, if I picked up an artist and was managing them, the immediately first thing I would do would be brand book. Um, the second thing would be bio. I want short, medium, and long bio for different things. Obviously, you want your elevator pitch. You want your medium bio for kind of things like we're doing here, where you want a little more information, but not a forever information. And then a long bio for press. Um, because I people... only sent his long bio and I had to edit it myself. <laughs> <laughs> the bus <laughs> i gotta redo i gotta redo my bio that's, that's, just, uh, that. miranda said it too and she got me thinking like yeah my bio's out of date i gotta redo that didn't sound good at all um yeah i think that there's i don't think that there's hard fast rules i just think again someone said it in the chat and they're right you're your own ceo so you've got to figure out for your business because you have to think of yourself as a business you are a business <laughs> you are an artist first and you have a skill but you're a business and you're putting yourself out there if if you're choosing for it not to be a hobby, which being a hobby artist is the best thing in the world and I applaud it and I love it. But if you're making that choice to take it from a hobby to try to, you know, monetize that, you've now become a business. So you just need to make sure that whoever you're talking to, whether it's an agent, whether it's a casting director, whatever your art form is, that whoever you're talking to can get a sense of you from like a few things in a very short period of time because you don't have... Like we're all guilty of it. We don't have attention spans anymore. The attention span is going like this and this and this and this. So um, whatever those things are for you, because it, it's really, you, you've got to decide what they are, right? Like, for sure. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm just going to drop two things that I've heard in relation to EPKs that you could sort of take them or leave them. And like, uh, like Dante said, I think there's a lot of different approaches. Um, uh, having worked with a couple of different managers who are repping like, you know, producers and MCs and stuff, the EPK seems to be really popular uh, in terms of, again, that idea of having like literally a single PDF doc or a single page where people can link to everything that they want. Even as compared to a website, um, I've heard that, you know, oftentimes like to have a super clean website it costs money, right? So if you have a crappy website and you have to kind of dig to find stuff and you're not updating it regularly, an EPK is a cleaner way to go. But what I've also heard from other people is that the idea of investing in a website, if you're investing all of your brand and information into like Instagram, that's someone else's platform. You know, your website at the end of the day is your home turf. And so all of the investment that you put into that is yours. Uh, and so, you know, you can do what you want with those two pieces, but just two different things that I've heard as well from a sort of recording artist perspective. Um, and then, okay, we have another question here. Um, that's not a question. That's not a question. Well, no, there's one more here. Do artists, oh, okay. <laughs> do artists have to have an EPK resume and CV? Um, does anybody want to jump on that? Yeah, I mean, sure, I'll jump on it. Yeah. Um, I, I'd say so because again, it's all about catering, right? Like sometimes I used to just make my portfolio and then go to somebody and be like, well, where's your EPK? That's what I'm looking for, you know, or somebody else is looking for a website. 
which is more elaborate, right? Which is more of a bigger catalog. Mm -hmm. So the more of these things you have, the better, you know? And uh, also the, the, you need to, if you can grasp kind of, you start getting to know what kind of potential clients you have out there. Um, and you know, for example, like, okay, well, it looks like in my field, EPKs are most important. So then invest more into that, right? Mm. But yeah, the more variety, the better, because you want to be as fluid and as ready as possible to pivot towards any sort of uh, need For that's sure. within your realm, right? For sure. Um, I think one thing as well is there's probably a lot of overlap between an artist's resume and an artist's CV. Um, I think actually more often you would see a resume as being like job, you know, job opportunities, whereas a CV is really a summary of your um, accomplishments and, and your work. Uh, and so a CV is often predominantly going to be text based as well. You might have links in there, but really it's a long list of what you've done. And so that's not going to be relevant for every opportunity. Cause like, you know, like Pyro is saying, like Ray is saying, people don't want to read a block of text about your accomplishments. They want to see what you can do, or they want to see what you look like, or they just want links to your music. So I think that's where it comes back to what people have really been saying is being critical and curating um, whatever the, the version of your portfolio is that you're submitting to the opportunity that you're trying to secure in that moment. Um, do we have one more? Okay, one more question here. Um, for a multidisciplinary artist, would you suggest to have two different, or, oh, dancer, perhaps. For a multidisciplinary dancer, would you suggest to have two, oh, I need to read the whole question through one time, sorry. <laughs> okay, here we go, third time's charm. <laughs> for a multidisciplinary, would you suggest to have two different reels to submit? for example, dance and acting. And if you were to go for an agency who specializes in both, should you only go for one of those? As far as agency work goes, Pyro, can I flip that to you again? Yeah. Um, once again, like the whole catering situation, uh, you should definitely have a different acting reel uh, and make that its own thing and then have a separate dance reel. Uh, even when you do get represented by any agency, they're gonna ask for that as well. So definitely don't mash those together. Um, yeah, it's just super important to be organized in that way uh, because when it comes down to what you're catering towards, um, the more specific you are within the things that you have, like different resumes, um, different types of headshots, different types of body shots, different types of reels, um, the more specific you can cater towards something, right? Because I'm not, I'm never going to send my, my dance reel uh, if it's an acting job or something like that, right? Um, I don't want to, I don't want to bore them with my dance if they're only looking for the acting, you know? So, so definitely keep everything organized, um, high quality and just prepared to go. Awesome. I um, mean, the second part of the question here was, if you were to go for an agency who specializes in both, should you only go for one? So I think what he's asking is, if you're looking for representation, should you right. pick one or the other? Or should you do? No. When you're, when you're looking, uh, yeah, okay. So when you're applying for, a, like, a, to get a gig, like a movie or a television show, then it's, it has to be specific. If you're looking for representation, then it should be more broad and you should show that you can do all these different things but still have it all separated in different things and condense it into your portfolio which is what the whole thing's about today and then give that portfolio and so then they can flip through it um and if you were here at more at the beginning i i was talking about like the organization of like how you should put or put it in order um it's it's out there right this is recorded right <laughs> but um but yeah but you know put that put all of it in a portfolio nice and organized and then hand it to the your representation that you're going for so then they know that they have more opportunities to pretty much make money off of you awesome. yeah <laughs> that's awesome thank you so much um, okay, so that's it for our questions. We're like right on time here, which I love. Um, so just to kind of finally wrap things up here, um, I am going to say uh, thank you again to our supporters, um, uh, TD. Uh, uh, TD Bank in particular, Ready Commitment, thank you so much for supporting the panel and the Artist Development Program. Huge thanks 
to the panelists. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much for this information. Again, so practical, so useful. Um, uh, I want to remind everybody who's in the room today. Uh, next week, same time, same place, Andel and I will be back. Um, and we're going to be talking about, again, how do we actually put together some of these components? We're going to talk about how do you find creatives to work with for photos and videos? We're going to talk about what kind of hosting platforms, where can you create EPKs, um, all that kind of goodies. Uh, so come through next week. Um, of course, follow Unity Charity on Instagram if you don't already. Uh, and yeah, that's that. There's going to be that quick survey that comes through when you close the window. So please take 30 seconds to let us know how you felt about it. Um, we really appreciate that. And yeah, scroll up. Well, get, uh, Andel, you want to spin a one-two track over there and we can let people scroll up and follow people and make their way out slowly if you didn't catch everybody and all their handles and stuff. Uh, and yeah, putting in work. We'll be back next week. And uh, thanks so much to everybody for coming through.